Good morning, everybody. This is Jeff Gerard and Caleb Lawson, and uh, we come up with a name uh, for our podcast. It's called The Maker and the Mix, because we're not just talking about concrete. We're talking about us, the makers, too. So welcome um, to our second podcast. Yes, welcome. Excited to have you. I'm, I'm interested to see who joins. Um, you know, I don't know where the... Um, I don't know where the link was posted. I know Lane posted it, but I'm not 100 sure where that happened. So um, I'm excited to, you know, see whoever joins and yeah. As we get more podcasts under our belt, we'll uh, we'll have more people reading, watching, listening to these, and uh, and perhaps joining in as a conversation. And maybe I'll get my camera figured out. It's yeah it's a at the moment. We're rolling with it, um, but we're makers, not 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 um you know not studio executives uh, right. or 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 actors you know standing in front of camera, preening for the for the audience. Uh, we're just here. Maybe I preen. You can tell he's clean shaven. Um, so today's podcast, today's discussion is uh, polymer. Who needs it? Yeah, polymer. Who needs it? What is it? Why do we need it? Why do we use it? And why is it not used in most concrete? So before we jump into it, before we get into the chemistry of it and the different kinds of polymer out there and all the this and that and the whys and the wherefores, I'm going to roll the clock back to when I got, certainly not when I got started in concrete, but when I got started in this kind of concrete, uh, that was back in 1999, uh, back in the the old days, the prehistoric days, the the Buddy Roads and the Futong Cheng days. When a dinosaur, he might be offended. It, he is a legend. Or are you calling yourself a dinosaur? I'm calling myself a dinosaur. <laughs> I'm older than you, so. <laughs> but I've been around for you know. Buddy, we love you. Back back in the the old days, you know, just after fire was invented. Um, the kind of concrete we worked with was very close to conventional concrete. So when I mean conventional concrete, it's the kind we structural engineers uh, design things out of. You know, anybody who works with concrete as a trade, pouring foundations, uh, roads, uh, crafting bridges, or even doing something as important but simple as pouring a patio or a sidewalk. That's conventional concrete. The kind that comes from a batch plant is mixed in a, well, it's already mixed, but it's, it's put in a truck, it's delivered, and then it's delivered by chute, right? So that's conventional concrete. Your, your quickrete 5000s and your sacretes and your whatever version of a home center is an approximation of that. Um, and they're, as, as we discussed in the last podcast, they are uh, made for a purpose. They're made down to a cost for consumers to use to to cast things like uh, like a sidewalk or poor fence posts or things like that. Well, getting back to you know more conventional concrete, the things you cast tend to be rather large, have a high volume, and have a certain uh, set of performance characteristics that are not made necessarily clearly defined, but are well understood. If you're pouring a driveway, right, you're probably going to be using, you know, at minimum 3,000 PSI concrete, probably something higher. Uh, maybe your local uh, codes or your local um, convention, of what you like to do, creates a higher concrete, has more cement in it or whatever, right? Um, that slab is going to be probably four inches thick, maybe maybe more. Um, but... Yeah interjection four inches thick is uh pretty pretty thin in that world correct yeah like when i talk to other fellow structural engineers and other professional engineers and i tell them what i do um their reaction is quite shocked because in the structural world you know in buildings in the real world four inches is considered structurally very thin like you don't make things much thinner than that. Now, nowadays with uh, like UHPC and things like that, there are structures that are made thinner. Um, but in normal parlance of things you make out of concrete, four inches is quite thin. Uh, six inches, eight inches is more conventional. 
Now, the reason why I'm mentioning this, the reason why I bring this up is, is it leads to the root reason why polymer is used in some kinds of concrete. And that has to do with curing. Now, as we all know, concrete is made up of uh, several key ingredients and then additional ingredients that you could almost consider like spices that enhance the mix. Um, and for us, you know, pigment is one of those spices, one of those admixtures that we use to change the characteristics of the concrete. And that's purely a decorative thing. It has nothing to do with its strength or its durability. It's just how, how appealing is it? You know, do we want it to be pink or do we want it to be gray? Do we want it to be green? Whatever, right? Other admixtures like uh, super plasticizers or um, shrinkage reducing admixtures or pozzolans, those are ingredients, pozzolans are a little more than an admixture because they, they react with the cement, so they count as cement. Those are ingredients that modify the characteristics of the concrete, the workability, the strength characteristics, the durability, and all that. Okay. None of those matter. None of those matter if the two most important ingredients don't react properly. And those two ingredients are your water and your cement because those create the glue that holds it all together. Those create the whole stew of chemical compounds that your pozzolans react with, that bind everything together, that create the properties. Because otherwise, if you, if you didn't have those, you would just have sand, and if you are making concrete with rocks and it rocks and, and all the other things. So it's the cement and the, so the cement and the water are the two most important ingredients they are the foundational ingredients that everything else depends on. And if those ingredients are not mixed properly, if they're not proportioned properly up front, you're gonna get poor performance. You're not gonna get the right kind of uh, characteristics. So that's where water, cement water to cement ratio comes in. So if you can control the amount of water you put into your concrete, you're controlling and to some degree predicting the net characteristics. How strong is it? How durable is it? How porous or non-porous is it? All those things. But that's not enough. I mean, when you mix your concrete and you proportion all your ingredients very carefully, you are just setting the stage. It's like you're preparing a race car for the race. <laughs> but unlike preparing a race, well, just like preparing a race car, you still have to navigate it. You still have to drive it. You still have to win the race. And everybody's goal is to be first. And the last thing you want to do is be last or crash and, you know, be out of the race before it ends. Mm -hmm. And this is where curing is very important. And this is something that's often overlooked, even in the real world. Curing is not paid attention to because it involves attention and time. And those are things that a lot of people either don't have are not a, or are not aware of, or maybe they just don't care. And they've gotten away with things and that kind of, well, it worked last time, so I'm gonna keep doing it. That approach is a bit of a gamble and it doesn't work for everybody. So this is where polymer neatly dovetails into things. Before I get into that though, I'm gonna stick with conventional concrete. You don't use polymer in conventional concrete. You don't use polymer in a driveway. I mean, first of all, like in GFRC, the polymer is about a third of the co material cost of that, um, in that, that mixture. So it's very expensive. So using polymer in a conventional concrete would make it cost prohibitive. It would be too expensive to do. The, the second reason is when you have a very thick mass of concrete, a four inch thick slab or a six inch thick slab or an eight inch thick slab, you've got a huge volume, right? And, and there's a lot of water in that. Like especially conventional concrete has a lot of water in it. Um, that, that excess water that's in that mix is basically a reservoir. And where does water go? Like as your concrete cures, the chemical reaction consumes some of that water. But that's only part of it. Everything else is called water of convenience. You're, you're adding extra water to, to increase the workability. And that's why you'll see people, you know, with a hose 
just adding water because hey, we want to make the work, concrete more workable. That that's really bad because you're diluting the the, the glue and uh, everything else, and you're creating more open space. You're displacing all those particles that want to come together and form a tight matrix. Uh, you're you're making a more spongy and open pore structure. So the concrete's more porous. All that excess water can leave more easily because there's bigger channels for it to escape. But where does the water go away from? That excess water that's not part of the chemical reaction, that leaves through the surface. So the surface of, say, a driveway, um, the water can leave through the bottom into the gravel base or through the air up top. If you're pouring a floor and you're pouring against, say, a, a, a plastic vapor barrier, uh, the, the purpose of the vapor barrier basically keeps the moisture from the ground getting into the concrete so that slab doesn't stay moist over its lifetime. But it also does another thing is, is it seals the bottom of the slab so the water can't leave through the bottom. Way. It only goes one way. Okay, so that's, that's, un, that's a convenient thing. That's like half your curing. And, um, oh, there she is. Well, hello. Are you, can you hear us, Lane? Anyway, I'm gonna keep going. Um, Lane, can you hear us? Nope, oh, there's two left. Two left, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if everybody could see that or not, but I could see it and Caleb, you could see it. So yeah. maybe, maybe they could, all right. So, um, when we, you know, when I got started making concrete, this, the standard thickness was pretty thick. Some people cast three, four inch thick solid slabs, um, inch and a half, two inch thick slabs were more common. And so what I'm getting at is the slab thicknesses were, were quite thick. And if you recall of how a slab works in structural, how it behaves structurally in, in Fletcher, because like everything we, we make, I'm going to use a book as an example. We cast a flat panel. Maybe it's a wall panel. Maybe it's a countertop slab. Maybe it's a tabletop. Everything. Here we go. Okay. Everything we do is a beam once it um, is lift, picked up and lifted and moved around. Okay. So when you have a slab that's lifted and picked up, it's exposed on all sides. It's flexible right? And it needs to be strong enough to be able to resist those loads. So when a beam is lifted, it flexes. And when it flexes, you know, that one side is in compression, one side's in tension down here. And the tension side is where you would put your structural steel, re like rebar and structural wire and things like that. Or if in the case of GeoForce, you put your scrim. Okay. The top surface the extreme surfaces are where most of the work is done, where most of the strength is resisting. And as you move closer to the center of the slab, there's, there's no compression, there's no tension. So the actual center of the slab, the middle of that slab does no work. So if you have a thick slab that is full of water and only the surface is drying and that, that moisture at just under the surface is being replenished by the thickness of the slab, there's a long, it takes a long time for that surface to truly start to dry out to the point where it doesn't cure right. It's not the moisture from the center. Right. It's, it's drawing it from the center where the strength is less important and keeping that surface layers sure. that are important, uh, it allows them to keep hydrating, right? To gain strength. Because that's the whole thing is when you cast concrete, the moment you cast it, and the moment it transitions from a liquid to some a solid, it basically has no strength. And then a few hours after it gets hard, it's very, very fragile. It's very weak. And over time, that all those calcium silica hydrate gels start meshing together um, to form a solid, to form a strong solid. And, and time is a factor where different mix designs and different water cement ratios uh, achieve different curing rates, right? Curing is the, is the act of the, the chemical reaction happening and your concrete getting stronger. 
It's really important. So if, you're cast, you if you cast a thin slab, time. if you cast a thin slab, like three quarters of an inch or half an inch, the, the distance between the center of that slab and that face is very, very short. So that water doesn't have a long path to go to leave. So that slab is going to dry out and, and drop below that critical threshold where the concrete, the cement inside that concrete doesn't have enough moisture to keep that chemical reaction growing. Um, it, it, some of you may have seen my presentations either at World of Concrete or in, in my classes where I kind of relate that cement particles are like tomato seeds. I want to eat a tomato. So I plant a seed in the ground and I want that plant to grow so it makes tomatoes that I can eat. Well, when you plant a seed in the ground, you need to water it. You need to keep it watered for the plant to grow. And if you stop watering that plant, it, it dies, right? That's a bit of an extreme example, but it gets the point across is your cement hydration is important. And if the moisture levels inside your concrete drop below a critical threshold, and it doesn't take much for it to drop to where that chemical reaction basically stops, you're not getting the strength you're, you're expecting. The concrete might feel hard, but it's not strong. So you can't go off and go by just how does it feel. You can't go by kind of a seat of the pants, wrap your knuckles on it and go, oh, it's hard, therefore it's strong. Uh, only testing will show that. And that's just impractical for a lot of people. So the, the best way to, to make sure that your concrete is strong is uh, through a prescriptive way of, hey, we, we cast our concrete, we're going to cure it properly. Now, we all know when you cast concrete, you once you're done casting, you cover it in plastic to trap the moisture under that plastic. And maybe you put some blankets on it to help um, trap some of the heat that is generated during the, the hydration, because as cement hydrates, it undergoes heat process. And I don't want to get off on track here, but Curing under plastics is just the beginning. If you don't have polymer in your concrete and you're casting something thin and you're using Portland cement, you still need to then maintain that moisture level around the outside of the concrete so that the moisture that's inside your concrete doesn't evaporate, leave, and threaten the strength of your concrete. So what would you say, let's say for the sake of argument that you don't have a polymer in it, mm -hmm. uh, and you're creating a, let's call it an inch and a half thick piece of countertop, but the way that we do it, of course, your, your edges are gonna be built thick and your field, if you will, is gonna be left at three quarters of an inch thick. So let's say that that's your, you know, eight foot by two foot slab, let's call it countertop, kitchen countertop, 25 and a half inches. Um, you don't have polymer, so you've covered it in plastic. You have covered it in blankets to keep some heat in. Um, without polymer, to gain the same amount of strength um, that you would have with polymer, how long would you need to keep it covered? And would you need to do anything additional of, over and above keeping it covered in order to have that same level of strength um, and work, you know, and, and... So that's an excellent question. Um, I've done, I've been doing lots of flexural tests. I've done probably close to 1500 flexural tests over the last almost year. Um, in developing my own products. What I've seen is that if you have identical mixes, one with and one without polymer, and you look at say their seven day strength, you will lose at least 25% of your strength if you don't use polymer. And that's the exact correct. same curing technique. So exact same curing techniques, which is cover the piece in plastic overnight, Demold it the next day, and it's sitting in your shop. Air drying. Air drying. And then, and, and really from our standpoint, that to me, you know, I, I don't know that I care so much about 28 day strengths. I mean, it's a nice number to know, but um, for me as an artisan, and I imagine most of you, practical full yeah. strength is five to seven days because that's when I'm moving it to install it. Right. Um, right. Sometimes before. So, you know, your practical maximum strength, obviously it's going to keep you gaining strength and all of that, but your practical maximum strength is somewhere within the first week, most of the time, uh, sometimes in the second week. And so 
you know, my, my question then kind of coming back to it is, so there's the difference between polymer and no polymer with the exact same cure. What would you have to do to a no polymer concrete to get it to the level of polymer concrete? So, you know, how long would you have to leave it covered? So and there, there actually that? is a, a, a standard for that. Um, the Precast Concrete Institute, this happens to be one of the books that I use a lot and get in frame. There we go. I'm backwards. This, yeah, you can buy it online, I think, maybe still. Anyway, there's a standard for curing polymers in GFRC, and we're kind of getting into answering the question, what is polymer and who needs it, by talking about why it's important. Um, to make, and this is specific to GFRC. So again, the world of GFRC comes from the commercial world where building panels, things like that. To, to achieve a, because if you're making a, building panel, right? That's going up on a building and it's got to survive 20, 30, 40 years. Um, they are interested in long-term strength, right? So that's that's the main focus. And that's why the 28 day compressive strength is used so much because the performance of a structure is more important in the long-term to the people who use it and to the public in general than it's say one, three or five day strength is. Now to the people building this structure, the one, three, five, seven day strengths is extremely important. And those of you who have ever done uh, like slat, you know, cast multiple floor buildings, you need to know what the one day, three day strength is so that when do you strip the forms, right? And so the, there's the maturity method that's used to determine uh, all that. And I'm not gonna get into that, but it's important to know what its short-term strength is for the people making it. And it's important to know what its long-term strength is to the people using it. So our needs are a little different from our customers. And if our concrete is strong enough for us, it's definitely gonna be strong enough for the customers who are using it um, in general. I'm making well, I mean, my, generalizations my, my, It's like, can I handle it? You know, can, yeah, I, yeah. can I get it into the house? Is it strong enough for those practices? Because that's the most stress it's ever gonna be under in most cases. Right. It's, you know, a countertop or whatever, I mean, a table, Right, this has like a seven foot span. I can sit in the middle, but maybe I shouldn't sit in the middle day one. Right. But, but, but you gotta handle it. The house. You gotta be able to demold it. You gotta handle it. Um, in the last podcast, I mentioned that that slab that was being installed and it it snapped in two. That's a that's a catastrophic failure that you don't want to have happen because it's gonna cost you a lot of money. You know, you spend all the time to build the form and buy the materials and cast it and all the labor and things like that. But not to mention the, the loss of business or anything like that. Um, but my point, my point getting back to it, <laughs> let's, let's, you know, again, because it's not going to be, I, I understand the standard is probably cure it for seven days yeah. in a 100% humidity environment. All the That's obviously not a problem. Right for us, um, but is there a point? Let's say if I were to leave my slab under um, blankets, maybe it's a heating blanket uh, and plastic for forty-eight hours. Would that be enough, or you know, seventy-two hours, or would seventeen or eighteen hours be enough? You know, is there a point at which not using polymer does not become a detriment? Yeah, I, I keep. I, I'm not skirting the issue. I keep getting off track. The answer is this: the performance specification written by PCI for curing polymers, and that's what we're talking about is curing polymers, not bonding agents, but curing polymers, is to achieve the 28-day flexural strength of your concrete. Again, the long term, right? It's bending strength. Right. You have to wet cure that concrete for seven continuous days and then let it air dry for the remaining time for that concrete to equal the strength of the same exact mix that uses curing polymer in it that is only cured under plastic for one day. And the rest of the time, the next 27 days are air cured. So the difference yeah. is <clears throat> six days, six day difference. And that's for the kind of concrete 
in the thicknesses we make, three quarters of an inch, one inch thick, that sort of thing. Not thick slabs, not something else. It's a direct comparison to what we're making. In fact, those of us who use GFRC, at least my the stuff I teach, I teach with a commercial mix. And the reason why I teach with a commercial, you know, I've tweaked it a little bit, but the reason why I'm using a commercial-based mix as a foundation of my mix design is it works. And there's a huge body of, body of test data and real world actual stuff that's out there for the last 40 years. In fact, I was reading, reading some research papers that were written in 1981 this morning. So, you know, going back 40 years plus about GFRC. So this is a situation- I think that would make it out of date, being that it's earlier days. Well, <clears throat> uh, if it ain't broke, why fix it? You know, I, I read a, a, a comment this morning about somebody was talking about fibers and we we're talking, it was about fiber loading and, you know, the typical GFRC premix load is 3%. And the comment was, well, why do you need 3%? What are you making? Right? So the, the, the point of that was, Hey, I get away with 2%. Everything I do works with 2%. Why do you need 3%? And that's an excellent point. Um, if you're not making anything that demands a lot of performance, then you can get away with a lot. But if you do suddenly start to make something that does require a lot of performance, then you better pay attention to the details and understand why you're using it. So let's get back to the, the original question, Polymer, why, you know, who needs it? Well, We've kind of started to answer that question. The role of polymer, and there's lots of different kinds of polymer in, in GFRs in concrete, is as a curing agent, as a as a means of, and its sole purpose is to slow the evaporation rate of the water that's in your concrete. It's like an internal curing membrane. It's like that plastic that you put on overnight, but it's there all the time. That's its job. Polymer does not make your concrete stronger. What it does is it keeps your concrete from getting weaker by drying out. And that's a big difference. Uh, poly yeah. Polymer also doesn't prevent curling or, sh or shrinkage or anything like that. That's either, that's usually from poor curing practices or for some other factors that don't have anything to do with polymer. Because the polymer is throughout the whole slab. So it's it's acting equally everywhere. Um, well, I mean, if you leave your eight foot slab under under infrared heat, extreme infrared heat overnight, like it's gonna curl because you're drying out the top surface. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Um, um, so you know, I mentioned there's different kinds of polymer. In fact, I have a I've had read this book for a long time. Um, Handbook of polymer modified concrete and mortars properties and process technology. So this is a very dense textbook on chemistry and the different kinds of polymers. There's, you know, we use acrylic polymers in GFRC and in other kinds of concrete that are for curing purposes, but not all polymers do that. Um, there's EVAs, ethylene vinyl acetate, uh, should have looked this up and I can't remember because I don't use them, but there's EVAs and PVAs and styrene butadiene rubbers, SBRs. There's natural latexes. In fact, the very first re recorded instance in the technical papers for using polymer in concrete was in 1923 with natural latex rubber. Um, didn't go very far, but it was an experiment. And the most polymers that are used in, in, reg in other forms of concrete are as bonding agents, as glue, as adhesives, um, thin sets, micro toppings, self-leveling overlays are full of polymers. And in those instances, those polymers are used to glue that new stuff to the old stuff. And they're typically a very high solids content. So some mixes might use 10% solids, might use 20% solids. I've seen some mixed formulations that use up to 30% polymer solids in the concrete. And that's gonna make the concrete really rubbery and flexible 
and and have all those great properties that you want for things like a micro topping or a self leveling overlay because you don't want it to peel up or flake off or crack because the you know substrate moves. I mean, it is almost taking on the characteristics of the polymer. At right. That point. In 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 those specific High instances, doses. absolutely. Right. Um, but like. For GFRC, even even using the the commercial polymers like Forton and Polyplex, there's a few others. Those are only used at a, maybe a five or six percent load. So, in that instance, the characteristics of the concrete are still dominated by the concrete itself. Your concrete formulation, structurally, I mean, is largely influenced by what you put in it. Now, your personal interaction with the concrete is going to be affected by the polymer. And by what polymer are you using? There's a big difference between liquid polymers and dry polymers and the way they disperse and all that. And I'm not going to get into that here, but if you've kind of grown up using a liquid commercial GFRC polymer, I'm just going to use Forton as an instance because that's it's common. I have a lot, a lot of people have used it. But it's not the only one on the on the market. Um, your personal experience as you're working with it is it tends to be really sticky. Uh, feel free to interject your reactions. Um, the concrete tends to be kind of foamy and and spongy and things like that. And those are not necessarily the most desirable characteristics well, yeah, it, for the it, kind it, of concrete we make. Air. It, it, it entrains air, it seems like, so it, you get less dense concrete. With, it, with it, it does. In my, um, in my experience, than you do with a dry. And that a large reason for that is that polymer was developed in conjunction with the development of GFRC for the commercial world and the equipment used to cast it, which is the large peristaltic pump sprayers. So everything about GFRC, the entire world of GFRC is a, is a system. You got the, the ingredients, you got the mix design, you got the equipment, and that's all tailored, very carefully tailored to do one thing. Mm -hmm. We don't do, a lot of us don't use that. So when you take away the spraying effect from that high pressure, high volume sprayer, you lose the ability to purge the air. And if you're just doing direct casting or, or things like that, now that air that's being whipped into the concrete stuck there stays there. Right. Um, well, and I wanted to, to make a, a, an interesting point. I was thinking about, okay, you know, we as a society, I think, are always after okay, the new, the new, the next best thing, um, and I, that's a good thing, right? You know, our computers are always being being upgraded, our cars are always being upgraded. But then I think also, you know, about like for instance, Mercedes Benz, love Mercedes Benz, but typically the technology in a Mercedes Benz is seven to ten years ahead of its time. Right, they are on the cutting edge. Okay, here we go. Now we're recording again. So, All right, so we had a little technical glitch there. No big deal. We're going to keep going. Um, so Mercedes-Benz, I like them. And they are on the cutting edge almost always of technology inside the vehicle. Now, what I have observed is that that is a point of failure in those vehicles. Um, Being and, leading edge sometimes. Yeah, and that technology is going to end up in a Ford in eight years. Absolutely. Um, you think about autopilot. I mean, you know, Mercedes was one of the first to have a cruise control that was automatic. And so where I'm getting at is being on the bleeding edge is awesome and really exciting. And it's, but it, it does have um, detri detriments that you don't know about until it's in production, right? So in theory, all of this is super, super exciting and cool. And in practice, it might also be super exciting and cool but it might have a failure point that we don't know yet. Now, contrast that with the small block uh, Chevrolet V8 motor, right? The 350 small block Chevy, um, it's gone through several iterations. I mean, there's, you know, fuel injection that's been added to it, but the bare bones of the, the engine block are identical to what we had in the, you know, Bel Air in 1950s. Right. Push on technology. And so my point being, progress is super, super important, but so is, you know, so are the roots, right? Like Chevy, GM would not still be using that motor if it was, because they've got an enormous R&D department that is spending 
tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars every year on developing better technology. For right. vehicles. I mean, the, the car, my wife has a, a 2015 Yukon. Um, it has a 5.3 liter uh, V8, which is based on the Chevy small block. Um, so it's not a 350 anymore. It's a, I don't know what the cubic inches are, but it's the same block, roughly. Um, it's based on the same technology. Now, it has technology that shuts down four of the cylinders when you're on the highway from better fuel economy. That wasn't possible, but actually that was possible in, I'll say Lincoln tried to do it in the 70s. At least in the 80s, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but my point is technology has been updated. The engine blocks remain the same. And despite spending tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars a year on R&D, they're still using that engine block, which tells you the engine block is a valid base. And so, you know, taking it back to concrete, yes. My, my question earlier, well, is the 1980s ancient history, like, is it too old, is it gone, whatever? No, they have it there for a reason. And there are companies spending tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars on research and development to, to make concrete better for a building material because it's been used for thousands of years and it's going to stop tomorrow. And they're still using polymer for a reason. Absolutely. That's a really good point. Um, I think like the way my, my point of view, and it's important, like to me, context is is extremely important because if you if you make a blanket statement that's a standalone statement that you don't paint the bigger picture that that statement is uh, colored by, you don't really know where where somebody's coming from or what that statement's all about. I'm speaking to people who do this as a business. That's what CCI's job is: is to help people succeed as a business. Not to do it as a hobby, not to do it because it's fun, not to do it because you want to be a mad scientist in your garage. Those are all great reasons. But when you run a business and you, when you want to run a successful business, and, and Caleb, you are definitely somebody who can speak currently to this, running a very successful concrete countertop and architectural creative concrete business. Um, Every decision you make is colored by the fact that you're running a business. Right. You're not playing, you're not tinkering, you're not creating. You're doing creations and you are creating, but you're doing it for a reason. You're doing it to make money. You're doing it to run a business so that you can be profitable, that you can grow, you can feed your family, you can support your, your employees and Businesses can't afford to make decisions that can lead to expensive costs and failures down the line. And I would add to that might lead, right? Because might, it's might lead. The reality is maybe you're in a super, you know, friendly environment to curing concrete. Maybe you're in Florida and it's super crazy in high humidity. Uh -huh. and and you know so that aids in the curing of your concrete it helps it to stay at a higher temperature for longer if it's covered things of that nature uh, if you're in you know nebraska in the winter you know these these things are you have to do more right to to make your concrete cure properly than you would in florida i mean when i was in florida i never had to do any more than cover my concrete with a piece of plastic right that was enough. It was 90 degrees at midnight, right? Here in North Carolina, I have to cover it with more than plastic and leave my heat on in the winter. Mm -hmm. Because even though we in North Carolina have very mild winters, respectively, when you consider, you know, Montana, yeah, uh, or, or some of those, you know, North uh, Midwest kind of states, um, you talk Colorado out west, that kind of thing. Um, you know, it still gets cold. It's still it was 34 degrees this morning. So that if I just left the doors open and left the heat off, like my concrete is not going to cure properly. So I have to pay more attention here. And y'all in in environments that are very harsh and, and cold need to pay more attention right. um, to how you're choosing to cure your concrete. So it really is an active choice, not just to uh, throw something over it, you know, and and yeah, so my point in all of that is basically the same point Jeff made is 
as a business owner, in, in the act of running a business, we have to make choices. So, you know, I've heard a lot of people use the phrase sealer of the month club, right? Um, and I think that's, it's an interesting exploration that maybe we'll get into later, but the point is choosing different product to try and improve your business, but using the product in the business is never something I'm gonna encourage, right? So try and do seal it by all means, just don't do it on the project. Try to, you know, make time on the weekend to roll, you know, to, to roll your sealer or spread or whatever you're doing on some sort of sample piece. That, that that's, a, that's a can of worms that we don't want to open right now. But, right. but my point is. Don't ever you, experiment on your customers. If you want to improve, if you want to change the game, yeah. great, do so. But do it in a controlled environment where you can know what the results are going to be before you translate it to your clients. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. And I'm not getting into sealer or anything like that. I'm just saying, like, we as a, this baby industry have a tendency to experiment on clients, and, and I don't love that. Um, very good point. Very good point. Uh, something that I've seen over the last 20 something years, and we probably will still, still see for the next 20 years, is, you know, that the tendency to kind of go rogue and to do your own thing. Um, that's, that's pretty prevalent in this industry. A lot of people are very proud of the fact that they're they're independent, and that's great. And that's kind of what makes this industry so special. Um, but we have to remember that we as humans, our choices and our feelings don't matter because we're working with a material that doesn't care about us. Our boss is the concrete, right? Our boss, the concrete, does what it does. And if we don't handle it right, if we don't make it right, we don't mix it properly, we don't proportion it properly, if we don't cure it properly, it's going to tell us. It's going to scream and hit us over the head. And it's going to do it by cracking yeah. or curling yeah. or doing something that we don't want. And yeah. generally speaking, when we make a piece and it doesn't do what we want, it's expensive. And you know, if you're making a big project for a, a, a customer, maybe this is a big dining room table, or maybe it's a fireplace around, or who knows what it is, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But if it's pretty big and it doesn't turn out right, and you have to do it again, not only does it cost you all that money because you have to do it again, but now your customer's very unhappy. And maybe your business takes a, a hit in reputation because now you haven't met, you haven't satisfied your promise to deliver something that they're expecting. So there are very deep and profound implications to going counter to good practice. Curing is one of those good practices that is always preached. And I'm not just talking about in our field. And, you know, I spoke at World of Concrete for, I don't know, 14, 15 years. And it, with other speakers, curing is such an important part of our field. But it's right. so it's done so lackadaisically in under the in most circumstances. And the only places where it's really done um, with us any degree of control are in precast plants, especially precast plants where they're making a structural element that has to be, you know, there's a lot of liability tied to it. A bridge girder, for instance, or any, something like that, um, where the failure of that that member, if it's traced back to the people making it, that that could be quite serious. And we don't we don't have to worry about that. But the point is, curing is an extremely important part of making concrete. And the normal curing process of covering things in plastic and keeping it wet for a long time is simple and cheap in terms of materials, but expensive in terms of time. Nobody can afford to have a piece of concrete sit on their casting tables for a week. And then don't even get us started on ghosting because, I mean, things are... Right, you know. exactly. Because we are extremely sensitive to the vi visual variations in our concrete. The things that we can't tolerate aren't even a concept in the rest of the concrete world. So we're extreme. We are on a very sharp, 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 pointy end of... The sensitivity scale. I when mean, we're on the bleeding edge, really. We are on the bleeding edge, where 
you know, two slabs that have to be next to each other and one's, you know, a half shade difference than the other, that that's perhaps a reject of the process of the whole project because things weren't perfect. So we right. are on the bleeding edge because of the nature of the of the types of products and the types of customers we we cater to. So to tie it back together, because exactly. we are, uh, you know, we are we are a little bit above our, our typical 45 minute kind of uh, deal. I want to, you know, I want to respect the time of people listening. Um, but to kind of tie it back all together is, you know, until such a time when the standard changes, it seems to me smart to at the very least do your own testing. Right. And very few people who are in business who are running successful businesses have that kind of time. And so they are kind of left to trusting other people who advocate for certain practices. Um, I'd like to think that some people trust me because not only am I an engineer, I'm a licensed professional engineer. So that means just like a doctor has to get a license, just like a lawyer has to get a license, I have to get a license. It's that, that big oh. thing right there. That's my license. Okay. It's not just a casual thing. It's not that I went to school and, and got spit out. And uh, one of those is my diploma. Both of the, both of those are my diplomas, bachelor's, master's. Okay. That doesn't mean anything. That means something right there. That well, says that it's past like a doctor or a lawyer or whatever to maintain your license. Right. You, know, you have to, I have to do continuous education. I have to self teach year after and year. You have to recertify, you know, you have to recertify. And no. the, the, the whole point of that is I have learned from and draw from a very vast wealth of experience and knowledge that have been passed on for the last century or, or more. Scientists and engineers who find best practices and tease out the behavior of things and consolidate them into rules and guidelines and equations and codes so that ultimately folks can make concrete and that concrete does what they expect and what their customers need. That's that's the whole point. So I'm not just making this up in my garage and I don't have an agenda to, uh, that's a personal agenda. It's I'm a conduit of all this knowledge based on my fellow engineers over the last century or so, all over the world, you know? So it's not just me, it's just not, Jeff Gerard saying what Jeff Gerard thinks. It's I'm just the mouthpiece of this vast information into a world that I have deep roots in. I have deep experience. I've been doing this since 1999, um, longer than a lot of other people. And my observations, my ex personal experiences, and certainly my experiences and interactions with the, the thousands of people I've taught over the years tell me and give me insight that it, that is very useful and helps me shape and tailor the kind of information that I know we all need. Mm -hmm. And this podcast is, is one of those, those, um, those needs is what is polymer and why do we use it? So kind of like you said, to, to not to wrap this up, I'm not ending at this moment, but Polymer is there to help your concrete cure and curing your concrete properly is essential to getting the kind of performance you want out of your concrete. And if you make a piece of concrete and you don't cure it properly, it's not going to do what you expect. And so you might make a piece that's a little bit different because maybe it was a dry day. Maybe that piece was a little bit longer. Maybe it was a little thinner. The design was different, something, right? But you're not aware of the differences or the, the significance of those differences. And your, right. your practices of maybe doing it, things a certain way have been successful in the past, but that one project revealed the weaknesses or the vulnerabilities of those practices. And all of a sudden, the piece didn't do what you wanted. It snapped when you were installing it. It broke when the customer used it. It curled or it cracked or it did something. Now, I'm not saying that's always going to happen, but 
changing the rules because you don't like them or somebody online told you you didn't have to follow them, but those rules are inconvenient for you to follow, that's not necessarily, you know, good practice for a business. And, you know, I'm going to kind of get on my soapbox and wave my finger and say, Jeff Gerard says, you know, do good curing. And Polymer makes it easy to, to do, cu do good curing. Uh, that's what its job is for. Um, it's and basically what you're saying is if you don't have Polymer, you need to have something else that makes up that purpose. Excellent summary. Excellent summary. And for a lot of folks, that's just not practical. Right. Now, to circle back, you know, we're talking about Portland cement based concrete here because Portland cement is a is a mixture that is a is an ingredient that's very common. We almost all of us use it. Most of us use it. Right. Um, but it's a very slow process. It's a slow chemical reaction. That's why we talk about the 28 day strength, because it takes about 28 days for that cement hydration to reach close to its ultimate. We'll call it 90 degree, 90 percent. I'm going to wave my hands there and generalize. Um, I do one day tests on my, my concrete because I want to see what it's like the day I flip it. I do one day tests. I do seven day tests. I do 28 day tests and I get, get a spectrum of how does it perform? Um, certainly when you take a piece of the concrete out of the mold, that's covered under plastic. It's hasn't really dried out yet. So there's no real issues there. It's what happens to the, to it in your shop after you take it out of plastic and you start doing stuff to it. That's that's the issue where a curing polymer can really help things uh, mitigate that, that moisture loss, maintain those high uh, curing rates, um, especially at the surface that, that we see, touch, feel, and gives the concrete its strength. Um, and that's, that's kind of the, the root of this discussion. Now, there are folks, I'm going to bring this up because I know about it. Um, some of us use rapid set cemental, CSA cement. And CSA cement has a chemistry. You do it, I do it. Um, some folks only use that. Now its chemistry is a little bit different from Portland cement in that it hydrates really fast, right? The, the, the whole matrix hydrates in hours, not days. So you literally can get 28 day strengths in 24 hours. And so its strength gain is faster than its drying rate. So technically, you do not need a curing polymer in, geo in a CSA cement. But I found that it helps. And it helps in the fact that when, because CSA cement reacts so fast, it gets hot. We've all seen this. It gets hot, and it can it can get so hot that you would burn yourself if you touched it. You know, 160 degrees is not that uncommon, especially for thicker sections. Now, if your concrete's hot and it's uncovered, um, because why would you cover concrete that you just finished casting? Um, it's going to start drying itself out. It's going to literally cook itself, dry itself out. And then you might see cracking or discoloration in the concrete. And I found even just covering that with plastic isn't always enough to prevent that in, in all circumstances. Now, so the, the, the practice is to, the, the, the way you get around that is you keep the concrete wet for the for a couple few hours. It's going through its thermal peak. So once it's past its thermal peak, it's not going to dry itself out and it's strong enough that you can just leave it alone covered plastic and you're, and you're done. Um, some people don't use polymer at all and they get away with it. I found that if you use polymer in that, you don't have to do the wetting and it makes it a whole lot easier to cast covered plastic and walk away. So it's less critical in CSA based cement because of the rapid strength gain, because it's giving you, you know, literally 28 days strengths in 24 hours. So three hours, you're getting, you know, probably three, four day strength in three, four hours after it gets hard. Um, so again, it's, it's strength again surpasses its drying rate, except for the fact that it gets hot. You know, if it gets hot and starts really cooking itself, then you can have some problems. Um, and so really, you know, cause the, this 
using a retarder like citric acid can can lower that curve of yeah it of, spreads out the the heat right, the slab, so the, right, the slab right. can cool and that's definitely a way to to mitigate it so in, in that case it's a recommendation but it's not a necessity yeah but and so i think you just if you're not going to use it in in rapid set you just need to be mindful yes of curing practices and those curing practices are over five six hours instead of you know a day yeah. So maybe maybe if you finish casting at 5 p.m., you need to stay around until 6 or 7 to make sure that it's properly covered and properly wet and, you know, things of that nature. And I've had to do that. Um, you know, alternatively, you can put polymer in it and make sure that you've dosed your retarder properly and covered plastic and go home. Yep. Um, and to reiterate, the polymer does not <clears throat> slow down the curing rate. It does not affect any. It's there to hold the moisture in. Okay. And... That's his sole job. Um, yes, acure, acrylic polymers are very good adhesives, but we don't have enough of that in the concrete to act as an adhesive. That's why thin sets and microtopics and things like that have such a high polymer load. It's a different kind of polymer that's cheaper um, because you need high polymer loads to get good adhesive properties and good structural characteristics. We're using it strictly as a curing element and only acrylic polymers of the right kind of acrylic polymer does do that, you know, hold the moisture in. That's what they're for. So in, in Portland cement based concrete, when you're casting something very thin, like we mostly do, um, and you are on a quick timeline, turnaround timeline of casting today, demolding tomorrow, do rapid processing, ceiling, getting it out the door. Maybe you're, maybe you get it out the door in a week, right? You cannot afford to be wet curing your pieces for a solid week before you even touch them. That's just not practical. That's why we use polymer. Well, there you go. So it's been a bit of a roundabout discussion and uh, hopefully you've, we've painted a better picture of why do we use polymer? And a lot of the discussion really didn't talk about the polymers themselves because what they are is less important than what they do. Right. And what they do is help cure your concrete. And that's really the heart of this discussion is cure your concrete properly so that you get what you expect. Because we work hard. We spend a lot of money. We spend a lot of time. Our customers are depending on us to give us good products that are going to perform well that are going to last a long time, that they're going to be happy with. And the more people who do things well, and the more customers who are happy, the more this industry and your success is going to grow. Exactly. So with that, I'm going to sign off. Caleb's going to sign off. Thanks for joining us. Take care. All right. See you. Bye-bye. Yeah,